Praise the Lord. Good morning. God bless you. It's nice to see that you weathered the storm. We all had some fun there. Would you turn with me in your bulletins? We have a number of announcements to make. Uh, first of all, today we will be taking up our special monthly offering for the building expansion project. Uh, you have that extra envelope there in your bulletin. And you can be a great blessing with your giving. A little bit later in the service, I'm going to tell you a couple of testimonies regarding the building fund. Uh, but I'll wait till a little, little bit later in the service. Uh, this Wednesday, the adult Bible study group will be watching part three of the documentary film Patterns of, Exod Patterns of Evidence Exodus. Uh, come and be blessed with fellowship and thought-provoking discussion. And also, too, the Safe to Shore Teen Ministry will have three birthdays to celebrate this week. So please come with your Bible and bring a friend. And with that, too, bring your sweet tooth. Next Sunday, March 11th, is the first annual Safe to Shore Teen Ministry fundraising bake sale. Hungry for God bake sale directly after the service. And once again, the teen ministry, out of whatever they raise, they are going to tithe. They're going to give 10% of whatever they raise to the building project. Uh, please note, on Sunday, March 18th, the church will hold its annual business meeting at 4 p.m. here in the sanctuary, and refreshments will be provided. Uh, partners are strongly encouraged to attend and participate in the meeting. And even if you're not an official partner of Vineyard Assembly of God, uh, but you still consider this to be your church, feel free to come. Uh, you just won't be able to vote. You won't have a voice at the meeting, but you can sit in and observe the meeting and see all of the reports and just see the great blessing that God is doing here at this church. And for the ladies of Vineyard Assembly of God, please join us as we attend. Why did I say us? It says us in there. I'm not going to this ladies' event. So please join the ladies as we attend the Brave Conference in New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, Saturday, March 24th at 9 a.m. Uh, they have a website there that you can register at. The cost is $25 before March 15th. <clears throat> and $30 after March 15th. And for students and seniors, the cost is $15. Uh, the sign-up sheet and the poster are there in the church foyer. And uh, the church is planning on uh, having the ladies take the church van, uh, so you'll be able to be transported that way to New Bedford and back. <clears throat> so with that, let's all stand and let's take our Bibles in our hands. We have been reading in the book of Romans, but we're going to do something a little bit different today. If you would, please turn with me to Acts chapter 1. I'm sure many of you noticed how different life is without electrical power, right? All of a sudden, things that you normally don't even think about, you have to think about. You know, especially if you have well water, you know, you, like we do here, we got to tell the kids, you, you know, be careful about flushing the toilet, you know, don't turn the sinks on, don't open the refrigerator and stand there for five minutes looking to try and decide what you want to eat. You know, all these little things like that, of course, you can't watch TV by candlelight, it just doesn't work. And it helps us to remember that we need power. So let's look at Acts chapter 1, and would you look with me at verse 8. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
I'm sure many of you know this already, but in case you don't, I'm going to tell you. The original Greek word that got translated as power in English is the Greek word dunamis. It's the same root word that we've created the words dynamite and dynamo and dynamic from. It's a word that literally means power that causes things to happen. And that's what the Holy Spirit gives us in the church. It, he gives His power to cause things to happen. Things in our lives to happen. Things in our hearts to happen. Changes in our minds, in our thinking, in our hearts to happen. And of course, motivating us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ wherever we go. So let's pray together today. And let's remember to pray too for all of our brothers and sisters who are away on vacations or traveling or stuck off islands still or whatever's happening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you today and we praise you, Lord. Today, Lord, we appeal to your promise in Scripture that the Holy Spirit will come upon us and we will receive power from you, Lord, to be witnesses for you in our local area, on this island, and even across this world. Lord in heaven, we pray for our brothers and sisters today who are away traveling on vacation or who may be still stuck off island, or Lord, who are homesick, or who, Lord, who are still dealing with no electrical power. Father, we pray for them, Lord Jesus, that you would just visit them and bless them wherever they are, whatever they are doing this morning. Lord, let them sense a moment of the Holy Spirit that will motivate them to just spend whatever amount of time they choose in prayer, in praise, in worship, and in your word. Lord in heaven, we pray today that you will fill this church with the Holy Spirit, that you would fill our hearts with your power, and that your anointing would be upon every single aspect of this service. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There we are. Hallelujah. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm so grateful to see old and new faces this morning. Our God is an awesome God. Lights on, lights off. Our light still shines. Amen. I'm thankful for what God is also doing in this body, in this day. Amen. I want to encourage you to allow the Lord to use you, no matter what you're going through. This is also a personal testimony. We're going to go through things. But God is with us. Some days we don't feel holy, sanctified, washed in the blood, as they used to say. But we still are holy because of Jesus, sanctified and washed in the blood of Christ Almighty. Amen. So be encouraged this morning. Be encouraged. Our God reigns. He reigns. Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus. If you're able to stand, please stand. If you're able to raise your hands and rejoice, raise your hands and rejoice. We are free. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen. Sometimes you don't appreciate your legs until you break one and you can't use it. Sometimes you don't appreciate your arm until you break one and you need your other arm to do both things. It's a struggle. So while you have it and while you can use it, come on now. 
appreciate. Lord, we say thank you this morning. We give you glory, honor, and praise this morning. There is none like you, Lord Jesus. You reign in the heavens and you reign in the earth. You are the king of glory. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in between. Amen? Hallelujah. Come on, rejoice. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. You reign, Lord. There is none like you, Jesus.
You're so worthy. You're so worthy. You're so worthy. You're so worthy. He didn't have to do it, but he did. He said yes to the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Just give him a thank you offering this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're just so worthy, Lord. he's done for you one thing. One thing that he's brought you through. We say thank you. Now the things that you've asked him for, think of those things. And say thank you right now because he is moving on our behalf.
everything we need is in Christ Jesus. Everything we need is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Just worship the King of glory. Lift your voices if you're able to the King, eternal, immortal, the one and true living God. The one and true living God. He is all truth. They have this new, new saying, you know, find your truth. <laughs> but the truth is, the truth is in Jesus and nowhere else. He is the truth. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, God. So let's sing hallelujah to the king of glory. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Hosanna. Stretched hands, he upholds us. His right hand upholds me. Hosanna.
let's sing that one more time. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Let our feet be lifted up. Hosanna. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's give him a great praise. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Thank you, Lord you. Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We exalt you, O oh God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. God bless you, church. Hallelujah. You may be seated, but keep yourselves in an attitude of praise and worship. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is so awesome. So awesome. So awesome. Hallelujah. I didn't have a chance to uh, speak with him prior to service, so this is probably going to come as a little bit of a shock and embarrassment, but I see our brother Joseph Wooden here, and uh, we thank God for you. We thank God for you and for the work that God's done in your life and uh, read in the paper about your new position that you have in Alaska, moving in just a few weeks, right? Amen. Amen. Would it be okay if we prayed with you as a church today? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Hallelujah. Let's just stretch a hand out towards our brother. Hallelujah. Father in heaven. I thank you, Lord God, that you are a God who brings justice and who brings restorations. A God who desires to give blessing to his children, Lord. And Father, you know that my brother walked through a very difficult time. And Lord in heaven, it, I know that it has been a hard journey for him. But Lord God, you have opened up a door for him, Lord, that no man could shut. And though, Lord, it requires about as massive a change as you can imagine, <laughs> Lord, we know that your hand of blessing goes with him, Lord. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would assure him that our love goes with him as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to take a moment, too, to recognize all of our first-time visitors. If you are here for the very first time at Vineyard Assembly of God, just slip up your hand. We have a gift for you. We've got some visitors right down here in this back row. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. Is there anyone else that this is your very first time? Praise the Lord. Well, thank you very much. God bless you for coming. Praise the Lord. We got that gift coming to you from our ushers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We have another very special guest with us today. And uh, we've got our brother, Daniel Soul, with us. God bless you. Daniel, why don't you come 
and uh, Junior is going to come too to provide some translation for us. Uh, Junior introduced me to Daniel, and Daniel gave me this incredible worship CD that he has. And so I've asked him to not only share a song, but to share a few words with the church. Estou muito feliz por estar a primeira vez aqui nessa linda igreja e conhecer um abençoado, um pastor abençoado. É, quando estive aqui na terça-feira, creio que foi terça-feira, estou muito bom de cabeça, quarta-feira, eu fui recebido tão calorosamente que eu me senti como estivesse na minha igreja ali no Brasil. E eu posso ver que tem homens de Deus aqui. Tem mulheres de Deus aqui. Deus ele tem o melhor para a sua vida nesta manhã. Para mim é uma alegria muito grande. Por onde eu tenho passado, eu tenho visto as mãos de Deus fazer milagres. E nesta manhã, eu quero profetizar na sua vida que é tempo de milagre na sua vida. É tempo de milagre na sua casa. Eu sou um milagre. Esses é, 27 anos, Deus me deu uma palavra ali no Rio de Janeiro. Sou, uma, sou de uma família de cantores e pastores. Eu falo só, minha família já dá para encher esse lugar. Mas eu louvo ao Senhor, porque quando Ele me deu uma palavra, Ele mandou, Ele me disse assim, Daniel, sai do meio da sua parentela e vai para onde que eu quero que tu vá, porque eu me preocupo com almas. Você não é um artista, você é um adorador. E nesta manhã, eu vi um adorador aqui nesse palco. E eu vi que ela não é um artista. Eu vi que através dela, Deus ele tocou nesta manhã na sua vida. E da maneira que você entrou, você não vai embora. Porque a presença do grande eu sou está aqui para mudar o quadro da sua vida. Ontem tivemos um culto abençoado na casa do Júnior. E aonde é a manifestação de Deus operou naquele lugar. Nessa manhã, não é diferente na sua vida. Deus tem me levado em nações. E pela quinta vez eu volto à América. E eu falei para o Júnior. Júnior sempre liga para mim no Brasil. E falou, Daniel... Deus me deu uma direção e eu conheci um homem de Deus você ora por mim? e quando ele pediu a oração o Senhor me falou que foi ele que pôs ele neste lugar porque há um propósito e o pastor era homem de Deus e quando eu cheguei aqui na quarta-feira eu senti uma graça muito grande é a segunda vez que nós estamos vendo. E é gostoso quando nós testificando que é o mesmo Espírito. O mesmo Deus que está no Brasil. Ele usa o homem de Deus neste lugar. Há uma nova história para a sua vida. E aquilo que o Senhor falou lá atrás. Ele manda dizer que Ele é fiel para cumprir na tua vida, ainda que alguém não acredita no teu ministério, o Senhor acredita, o Senhor conhece o teu coração, e o impressionante, Deus conhecia Davi, ele manda dizer que ele conhece o teu coração, tem hora se o pastor olha as, as, as circunstâncias. O pastor já tinha parado há muito tempo. Mas o pastor está debaixo de uma promessa. E a promessa de Deus manda te dizer, pastor, que não está inválida. Ele não invalidou. Ainda que muitos tentaram cavar teu poço. Mas o Senhor manda te dizer que tu é um José. 
E ele não só vai cumprir na sua vida, mas no meio da tua parentela. Porque o milagre só começou. Senhor, estou tanto tempo. Chegou outro, já estou na minha frente. Mas o Senhor manda dizer que ainda é tempo. E Ele manda te preparar o teu coração. Porque não ficará só nessas quatro paredes. Ele manda dizer que Ele vai ampliar. Porque o milagre é tempo do milagre. E Ele manda o Senhor preparar. Porque é uma nova história. Ele está escrevendo para a sua vida. E manda te dizer ainda nesta manhã. Para que o pastor prossiga. Mesmo que doa. Mesmo que ninguém seja contigo. O Senhor manda dizer que Ele é contigo. E a porta que ele abre, ninguém fecha. E o Senhor manda dizer que ele vai abrir uma grande porta. E o pastor ficará surpreendente. O que o Senhor irá fazer. Eu glorifico ao Senhor. Porque eu vim preparado. Mas tudo é conforme que Deus quer. Eu preparei a canção para cantar. Mas parece que não está tocando ali no som. Mas eu queria cantar só um pedacinho de uma canção. E se Deus permitir a próxima vez, iremos adorar o Senhor. Se o CD não pegar, eu gostaria de convidar o guitarrista para cantar uma canção bem conhecida. Aleluia! Muitas vezes nós preparamos, mas quem faz a obra é Deus. Eu não faço nada, mas Deus faz. E você é um presente dEle. Você é um milagre dEle. Nesta manhã, livramento de Deus para a sua vida. Aleluia! Se o trovão e o mar se erguendo vem sobre a tempestade, eu vou a sobre as águas tu também. És Deus, descansarei, pois seis que és Deus. Se o trovão e o mar se erguendo vens sobre a tempestade, eu vou a Sobre as águas tu Você crê nisso? Também és Deus Descansarei Pois seis que és Deus Olha só Minha alma está Segura em ti você crê nisso? sabes bem que em Cristo firme estou se o trovão e o mar se erguendo sobre a terra Tempestade, eu voarei sobre as águas. Tu também és Deus. Descansarei, pois sei que és Deus. Descansarei.
Hallelujah. Gears É só ele que pode isso. Pastor, eu não sei que vou retornar, mas eu já me apaixonei por esse lugar. Deus está aqui. O Júnior falou, Daniel, descansa. Deixa Deus fazer o que ele quiser. E como adoradores, não como artista, nós queremos fazer coisas boas, perfeitas. Mas o melhor vem do coração de Deus. O melhor vem de Deus para a sua vida. Você não perdeu a batalha. Você não perdeu a guerra. Porque o general de guerra está aqui nesta manhã. Eu já quero agradecer essa oportunidade. E dizer para o pastor. Deus é fiel. Deus é fiel. E que Deus possa abençoar cada um nessa manhã. Eu estou muito feliz, eu vou embora. Mas eu vou levar uma alegria muito grande aqui. Eu sei que Deus, Ele já me abençoou. Deus já te abençoou nesta manhã. Deus te abençoe, pastor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And Brother Daniel, next time you're here, you have an open invitation. Praise the Lord, God bless you. Glory to God, glory to God, hallelujah. We're going to take up the tithes and offerings at the end of the service again this week. Uh, we're going to dismiss the children in a moment, so let's have the children come forward. But as promised, I have a testimony to share with you about the building project, the expansion of this church. Hi, honey. How are you? And here's the testimony, church. This past week, Two people came to me on two separate occasions from in this church. One woman, one man. The woman walked up to me and handed me a box with jewelry in it and said, this is for the building fund. Whatever the church can get for that is for the building fund. Then I had a man walk up to me and say, God has tremendously blessed me. This is for the building fund and handed me a thousand dollars in cash. I want to tell you, the Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God is moving here. God is going to do things and open doors, and I believe not only bring in resources from outside that we've never thought of, but also unleash faith on the inside of the body, and show us just creative ways of giving, too. Isn't that awesome? God is so good. God is so good. Hallelujah. Hey, guys, how you doing? Good. Hi. What are you doing way back there? I almost couldn't see you. <laughs> you brought your special Bible book. Good job. Let's pray together now, okay? Okay. Dear Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, O oh God, upon these children. Thank you for the blessings that all of these children are. And Lord, we pray the touch of the Holy Spirit to be upon each and every one of them. Help them in their friendships to have good friends. Help them in their school to have good school if they're in school. And bless them most importantly to grow in the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great class. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to get right into the Word of God this morning. 
And if you recall, if you've been here the past few weeks, I've been preaching this series on Lent, an invitation to repent. And this is now, today is the third Sunday of Lent in the six-week time leading up to Easter. And Lent was traditionally a time in the church where we look at ourselves in the mirror of God's word. And we're honest with ourselves and we allow the Holy Spirit to be honest with us and to really look at us and see the areas where God wants to improve in us, the areas where God wants to change and to transform and to bring freedom and healing within us. Three weeks ago, I preached about one of the major issues that we need to repent of not only in the church, but as a nation, are the sins that contribute to violence. And talking about how violence is not only in this nation, it's in Brazil and it's around the world in so many places because people have largely turned away from God and so have unleashed violence in doing so. Last week I preached against the sin of racism which is not only present here in America, but it's also sometimes present within the church of Jesus Christ, and it's also a universal human sin. It happens in all cultures all around the world, and it needs to be repented of. This week, the title of the message is To Break Every Chain. And we're going to talk about repenting of, and not just repenting of, but finding God's plan of freedom from every single addiction that we have. Because we are an addicted society, we are an addicted people as human beings. So would you turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 20 and through 25. Heavenly Father, as we're about to open your word together as a body of believers, as we're about to look into your holy scriptures, we ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would be so heavy upon us, O God, to open our hearts, to open our minds, to open our understandings, and most of all, to break down any wall of resistance, whether within ourselves or built there by our enemy, Satan and his demons, to prevent us from hearing and receiving your word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 20, the Bible says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power in divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Here at Vineyard Assembly of God and at many other churches, we sometimes sing that worship song by Tasha Cobbs, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus 
to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. We sing that song, and when we sing it, we understand that this is singing about the power of Jesus Christ to break any chain of any addiction that chains any person and to set them free. When we talk about addictions as Christians, we tend to, right away, we think of the big five. Sexual addictions and pornography, alcohol, drugs, nicotine, and gambling. Those tend to be the big five that we right away think of as addictions as Christians. And the reason why is because they're easily identifiable and they carry a social stigma and they're very easy to be self-righteous about. I mean, it's very easy for us to sit back and say, well, I'm not looking at pornography, I'm not a, a drunkard or addicted to alcohol, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not taking drugs, uh, I'm not into nicotine products, and I'm not gambling. Whew, thank you, Jesus, I must be okay. I'm not like those other people who have these struggles. But those aren't the only addictions that we have to deal with. What are some other ones that we deal with in the church? There are shopping addictions. <laughs> there are food addictions. There are video game addictions, computer addictions, technology addictions. There are exercise addictions. There's work addiction. There's relationship addictions. There are television addictions. In fact, Jane Velez Mitchell in her book, Addict Nation wrote, human beings are capable of becoming addicted to virtually anything from plastic surgery to texting. And it's true. Now, science has allowed us to understand the emotional and the physical aspects of addiction. Science understands that there are neurochemicals in the brain involved in the pleasure centers of the brain. Some addictions actually alter your body chemistry to make you physically dependent upon those things and make you physically crave those things. But all addictions ultimately are forms of self-medication that attempt to soothe past and present pain. Science has understood all that, and that's all absolutely true. But there's another level to addiction. Because what science can only understand are the physical aspects of addiction and the psychological aspects of addiction. But beyond the physical, beyond the body, beyond the psychology, beyond the soul, there is the spirit in every man and in every woman. Because science doesn't acknowledge the existence of the spirit, it can't deal with the things of the spirit. Only Jesus Christ can deal with the spirit. And there is a spiritual level to addictions. And that is the core, that is the root, that is the foundation. The Bible says that God made us as spirit, soul, and body. And that's counting from the outward in. The deepest part of every human being is their spirit man or their spirit woman. Here in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 25, the Bible is identifying the root issue that feeds all addictions on a spiritual level. The Bible mentions here in verse 24, sexual impurity. That's not saying, the Bible's saying that that's the only addiction. The Bible just uses that as the most extreme form of addiction because in talking about the most extreme form of addiction, it covers every other type of addiction as well. But there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. 
And I want to be very careful as I preach this message to you that this is not a message of condemnation. This is a message of liberation. This is a message not to tell people how bad you are because you're addicted, but it's to show you in your hopelessness in your addiction, in your frustration in your addiction, in, your, in the pre-existing conviction and shame of your addiction that Jesus Christ has made the way out. Not a way out, but the way out. Let's look at verse 20 now in Romans chapter 1. It says again, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, and I want you to remember this, His eternal power and divine nature, remember that phrase, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. The first aspect spiritually to breaking every chain of addiction in our lives is that to break every chain, the habit of excuses must be surrendered to Jesus. That's the first level spiritually of what has to happen within us, the habit of excuses. You see, we're funny as human beings. See, as human beings, we never mind taking credit for something we do good right? We don't mind that at all. But when we do something that we are ashamed of or that we know is wrong or what society or others look down as wrong or our husbands or wives look at as wrong, we tend to rely upon excuses in order to avoid unpleasant responsibilities. Let me give you some examples and these are kind of fun, these examples. How about some excuses for not paying your taxes? This excuse was given by an aide to a state governor here in the United States. He said, I suffer from late filing syndrome. That was the excuse he told the IRS. A British accountant, the British have income tax as well. He wrote, I've been too busy submitting my clients' tax returns. I'm too busy. I can't do my own. I'm doing everyone else's. How about an excuse for a car accident? Leaving home for, this is actual, from a police accident report. Leaving home for work, I drove out of my drive and straight into the bus. The bus was five minutes early. <laughs> so stay on time, Dominic. You never know. <laughs> then as Christians, we often have excuses for sins and addictions in our own lives. How about, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. You don't understand, Pastor. God has amazing plans for me, so Satan and his demons are really, really targeting me. I was born this way. I grew up this way. This is the environment I was raised in. Now, don't judge me because I'm doing better now than I ever have been before. All those are excuses that we as Christians in some form tend to rely on in order to excuse the responsibility of having to surrender our addictions to Jesus and allow him to break those chains. And you know, it started with our first parents back in Genesis chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. God shows up and confronts Adam and Eve. And God says to Adam, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some of this fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the devil made me do it. She said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. 
Now, the excuses that Adam and Eve gave there were untrue truths. Did you catch that? They were untrue truths. Say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? True, God had created Eve. True, Eve had given Adam the forbidden fruit. True, Satan had deceived Eve. But they were, those were all true, but it was untrue that those were the reasons for the sin. See, the reason was that Adam and Eve were still personally responsible as thinking human beings for their own actions. Despite all that had happened, Adam chose to take the fruit and put it into his mouth and bite and chew and swallow. And Eve did the same thing. They were still responsible. And when we look at this, this is why we need to be both compassionate toward one another in our struggles with addictions, but at the same time, we need to be committed to the truth about addictions. We show compassion because there are true contributing factors underlying people's addictions. We live in a fallen world. We live in an imperfect world, right? None of our genetics are ideal. So there is, for some people, there is a genetic factor. None of our environments that we grow up in are perfectly ideal. There are environmental issues. Sometimes some people are exposed at a very young age to things. And that has a contributing effect. There are traumas, there are abuses, there are anxieties. All those are contributing factors to people becoming addicted to something. But at the same time, we need to be committed to the truth that we are all still responsible for our own decisions and actions and that at root, excuses do not excuse So now we have to ask the question, if Jesus is so powerful, if the Holy Spirit is so present with the church, if God's word is so true, if prayer is effectual and powerful, why do Christians still show addictions? There are two answers to that. The first is that we tend to set boundaries and build walls around every area of our lives. We build little compartments in our lives, areas and boundaries where we say, God, your eternal power and divine nature have no access or application to this area of my life. This area of my life, that is mine. Jesus, you can have all of this in me, but this is mine. And we build those walls and we make a habit of using excuses to define those boundaries and to reinforce those walls. Remember that TV show, Extreme Makeover, Home Edition. Remember that? You know, move that bus. You know, and the people would come and they'd rebuild a home for somebody who needed a new home built. What was the first step that they did in every episode before beginning to build a new home? What did they do? What did they do? Shout it out. What did they do? They tore down the old. They bulldozed it flat. It was always fun to watch when they bring in the giant backhoes and they just rip through the house, you know? See, sometimes as believers, we are so comfortable with living in the old, rotting, moldy, broken, rat-infested house of our old ways of thinking and living 
that what do we do when we have Jesus come into our hearts? And what was Jesus' first job? He was a carpenter. He was a house builder. He walks in with all his tools, looks around at this house of our lives and says, we got to tear this thing down and start over. And what do we do? We're so comfortable with that, we panic. And so we throw on a few coats of excuse-colored paint to try and make it look nice, to try to convince Jesus, don't tear this down. I hate this part of me, but I love it because this is what makes me feel okay with these pains in my past or this or that. And Jesus says, look, son, look, daughter, I want to build you a brand new home, a dream home. Anything and everything that you can imagine in your heart and life, I want to construct that in you. I've got the plans. I've got the blueprints. But the first thing before I can do that, I've got to tear down the old. You got to get rid of the mold. Got to get rid of the rot. Get rid of the broken. Clear away the rats and let Jesus build again. We need to realize that God's eternal power is more than enough to break any addiction, to help you heal from any addiction, and to keep you free from any addiction. And we also need to realize that God's divine nature, meaning his love and his holiness, combined together to cause God to absolutely hate our addictions and absolutely want to help us overcome our addictions so that people are without excuse. We are without excuse today. God wants every one of his children to be free. God went to the cross and allowed himself to be nailed to the cross so that his children wouldn't have to walk through life wearing spiritual chains of addictions. God wants us free. We are without excuse. Let's look at verse 21 now of Romans chapter 1. It says, For though they knew God, and they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles." This passage here is talking about idolatry. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Number two, to break every chain, the practice of idolatry must be surrendered to Jesus. See, excuses are the tools that we use to protect ourselves from the pain of rejecting and repenting of our addictions because at the center of every addiction is an idol, another God that we are secretly worshiping. And this idol isn't a statue. It isn't an object like money, or drugs, or a pack of cigarettes, or whatever, or sex. This is an idol in the very center of our hearts that looks exactly like we do when we look in the mirror. It's an idol that we have created after our own image and after our own likeness. It is an idol of self. That is the core of every addiction, is the idol of self. Dr. William Hines, in his book, Leaving Yesterday Behind, writes, 
If you want to have the break with your past that really means something for all eternity, you must stop asking, how can I be happy? And begin asking, how can I make God happy? Because remember, sin, if you look at it, S-I-N, you can take it to stand for self-idolatry now. Because addictions derive much of their power and their control over people's lives because of the self-idolatry of wanting to please self rather than to please God. See, the addictions begin to deal with pain and hurt or some sense of inadequacy within us. But then as the addictions take hold on us, now all of a sudden it's no longer about the first pain, it's now about the pain of coming out of the addiction. I don't want to have to go through withdrawal. I don't want to have to go through this. I don't want to have to go through the pain of confession. I don't want to have to rearrange my life in any significant way to make my freedom possible. And so we hold on to the addiction because we ultimately want to please self. Because at its root, addiction really isn't a matter of willpower or not having willpower or physical dependency. Addiction is a matter of the heart. It comes down to a matter of the heart. Verse 21 says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. How tragic that is when we as Christians, we come to church, we raise our hands, we praise, we worship, we read the Bible, we rejoice, we know God, but do we really glorify him as God? God. They wait, Pastor, yeah, of course I glorify God as God. I just stood here for 30 minutes and I sang praises to God. I said, God, you're great. God, you're holy. God, you're wonderful. I know God. I glorify him as God. But if we're glorifying him as God, remember who is he as God? We've got his eternal power and his divine nature ready and available to give you every resource you need to help you walk free of your addiction. George and Jane met at work and they enjoyed a whirlwind of dates and romance and they got married just a few months after meeting. After being married for a while, Jane began to be disturbed by their marriage, and by George's behavior. And eventually got to the point where Jane called up her friend Jackie and said, you know, can, can we meet for lunch? I, I got to talk to you about George. So they met for lunch at Jane's favorite bistro. And Jane said to Jackie, although I'm George's wife, He doesn't honor and respect me as his wife. He doesn't even thank me for everything I do for him. Jackie replied to Jane, Jane, I got to be honest with you. Sorry to tell you this, but your husband, George, really doesn't love you. He only loves what you give him and what you do for him because George only loves himself. Very often we treat God the same way that George was treating Jane. 
We love being married to God. We love the relationship with God. We love everything God does for us. We love the name that he gave us. We love all the blessings that he pours into our lives. But ultimately, we don't really honor him as God of our life because we're in love with ourselves. See, we engage in self-idolatry when, when we treat Jesus as an accessory or as an app. I know I've used that illustration before. Emergency, press the Jesus app. But the rest of the time, we ignore him. We don't allow Jesus to truly be Lord over every area, over every relationship, over every habit, over every priority, over every addiction in our lives. If he is Lord, then that means he is master. I mean, we've already figured out we can't control our addiction anyway, so we're not in charge. The addiction is. We're never going to be in charge. We have to realize that God alone can be in charge. He's the master. And you let his authority come into your life. A great example of this happens in the Bible in 1 Samuel 5, verses 1 through 4. It says, after the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord and his head and his hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. See, when we become a Christian, we invite Jesus into our hearts. That's like the Ark of the Covenant being brought into the temple of Dagon. And right away, Jesus begins to push over the idol of self that we have in our hearts. And what do we tend to do? We pick that idol back up and we stand it back up again. And we keep doing that. And if we keep doing that, Jesus will not only knock the idol of self down, he's also going to break the idol of self. A preacher named Harry Ironside said that God is looking for broken men who have judged themselves in the light of the cross of Christ. When he wants anything done, he takes up men who have come to the end of themselves, whose confidence is not in themselves, but in God. Vance Havner says, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop. Broken clouds to give rain. Broken grain to give bread broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives its perfume. It is Peter weeping bitterly who returns to greater power than ever. Oswald Chambers said, leave the broken, irreversible past in God's hands and step out into an invincible future with him. And this is where that aspect of discipleship comes in. Because church, God's power can deliver you in a moment at an altar call, at a time of prayer, when you really cry out, God set me free from this addiction. God can set you free in a moment but you have to learn how to stay free. And we're going to talk about that in the next point. It says in Romans 1, verses 24 through 25, Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity 
for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged a truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Number three, to break every chain. The comfort of lies must be surrendered to Jesus. The comfort of lies must be surrendered to Jesus. The Bible tells us flat out that lies are the language of Satan. Jesus revealed that. And this is why people, Christians included, remain bound by the chains of addiction because in addition to the excuses, in addition to the idolatry, we turn to the comfort of lies to soothe the chafing of our consciences as we learn to believe that slavery and imprisonment and being chained up isn't so bad after all. That's a lie. But yet so many people live their lives believing that this addiction, this being chained up, isn't really that bad. Being enslaved to something else isn't that bad. It began in the Garden of Eden with Satan suggesting the first such lie. Genesis 3, 4 through 5, he said to Eve, you will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He told her the exact opposite what God had said. God told her the truth because the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. Satan told her a lie, but she chose the comfort of the lie. And we learn so well as human beings that we continue to seek the comfort of lies to make our addictions more bearable. We exchanged the truth about God for a lie. What are some of those lies, church, that we tell ourselves and we sometimes tell others? What do we tell ourselves? I'm working on it. It's a lie. If you're still in addiction, you're not working on it. I've got it under control. That's a really big lie because if it's an addiction, it's controlling you. I still sense the Holy Spirit, so everything's okay. That's one that we use a lot as Christians. I've tried to break free and I can't. That's a lie. All you've done in the past is when the chains started to hurt a little bit, maybe you rattled them a bit, but you really didn't try. Because had you tried, you would have desperately gone to Jesus Christ and you would have been willing to do anything, pay whatever price, accept whatever pain in order to break free. God uses it to keep me humble. God is never going to use sin to keep you humble. That's a lie. And here's the big one. I'm not as bad as other people I know. I'm not like that guy who was down at the Ritz, laying on the floor, puking his guts out, and he does it every Friday night. I'm not like that. I can handle my liquor. I'm not as bad as that. I only need to do two packs a day. I'm not like that person who does five. (laughs) I don't look at the really bad pornography. I'm not as bad as these other people. See, the truth about God is that God 
loves us too much to leave us as we are. That's the truth. God is mighty to save. And he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. And you know, God is still asking us the same question that Jesus asked a crippled man in Jerusalem and giving the same advice that Jesus gave to that man in Jerusalem in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, verse 6, Jesus walked up to a crippled man and said, Do you want to get well? Do you really want to break free? Do you really want these chains to be gone? If we say yes, Lord, then what does Jesus say in verse 8? He says, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. It's a step of faith. And then verse 14, what does Jesus say? He says, see, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. That's the discipleship part. Jesus sets us free, but we have to learn how to discipline ourselves to stay free. We can't allow Jesus to set us free and then go right back to the old habits and ways of living. Things have to change. We have to be willing to make changes in our lives, in our thinking, and in our view of ourselves. And sometimes that's what we need brothers and sisters for, to counsel with, with the word of God, to pray us through things, to help us to figure things out about our past and our hurts that maybe we can't really understand or they're too overwhelming for our minds. And God will use a brother or sister, some of them who have walked through in victory the same journey that you have to tell you these are the stones that I walked on that took me across this stream. If you walk on those same stones, you'll be free too. See, the problem that we face is that the lies are the locks on the spiritual chains of addictions. This is why the Bible talks about the therapy of confession. Because confession does two things. It encourages humility. That means it kills pride. And it encourages honesty. It kills lies. If you keep getting food poisoning every time you eat, then the cure for that is to make sure you wash your dishes properly. catch that? The germs have to be killed. The pride germ has to be killed. The lie germ has to be killed. And the only way to do that is to dose yourself with humility and honesty and confession accomplishes both. The Bible says in James 5.16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I want to nuance this a little bit. That doesn't mean that we have to have sessions where everybody takes turns standing up in front of the church and telling everybody, this is the sad story of all the garbage in my life. That's not what that teaches. Some churches do that, and it's wrong. It teaches that because it says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You find a brother or sister that you trust, preferably a woman with a woman and a man with a man that you trust, that you feel safe with, And that's who you confess to. And they pray for you. Okay? John 
1 John 1, 8 through 9 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Glory to God. Pastor Tim Keller said, when people say, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself, they mean that they have failed an idol whose approval is more important than God's. That's why the idol of the heart has to go. Why the lies, the comfort of lies has to go. The practice of idolatry has to go. And the habit of excuses have to go in order to break every chain. And remember, Jesus healed bodies, he heals minds, and he healed hearts. If he did that in the New Testament, he still does it today because Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And you know what? A healed body, a healed mind, and a healed heart is what every addict needs. Whether it's an addiction to drugs or it's an addiction to shopping, we need healed bodies, healed hearts, and healed minds. Brothers and sisters, would you stand with me, please? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God wants us all to be free, church. So free. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just take a moment to get into prayer right now. Remember, God is faithful and just. If you confess your sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. The other microphone sounded like a windstorm was happening. Glory to God. Just find that place of prayer, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Heavenly Father, We thank you, Lord, that it is written in your word that you remember that we are dust. <laughs> that you are acquainted as our great high priest with every weakness and every infirmity that we have. And that, Lord, you did not tell us these things in your word just to condemn us, tell us how bad we are, beat us up a little bit, and then just throw us on the wayside and go on. But you told us these things like a doctor diagnosing a patient, saying, this is where it's hurting, this is where it's diseased, this is where it's sick, and here's how we're going to cure it and make you well. Lord, you truly are our great physician. And I believe all over this room, starting right now, spiritual chains are snapping and falling off of people. 
as your people are making a decision to walk with you and your spirit is helping them to realize things about them that maybe they never realized before. Lord, I know that we're going to be able as a church to take these emblems of communion together with a new lightheartedness like we've never had before. A new freedom like we've never had before. And we thank you, Lord, that you make all things new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Paris and Allie are going to lead us. And today I'd like to ask some ladies to help distribute the emblems of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to ask my wife and Sister Emily, and we're going to ask Sister Catherine and Sister Nilma to help us distribute the emblems of the Lord's Supper. Hallelujah, Lord. It says in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The way Mark records it is that Jesus and the disciples were just eating together, sharing a meal. And then suddenly Jesus broke into their meal and took bread and broke it and handed it out and spoke to them about it. And then took the cup and handed that out and spoke to them about it. I like that example because it shows how we just go along with life in the ordinary and then Jesus breaks into our ordinary with his extraordinary. He tells us and reminds us, I am here to save. I am here to help you live in a better way. That's what we're remembering as we take these emblems of communion today. So brothers and sisters, with hearts cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, washed from the guilt and stain of our sins, let's partake of these emblems with freedom and with joy today. Let's partake together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. God is so good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Church, as we prepare to go, I ask if Brother Dominic would come to close us in a word of prayer. But our ushers are going to be by the back doors, and you can drop in your tithe and offering envelopes in there. Uh, Whatever you put in with the building fund, just put that in the building fund envelope so that we can uh, put that into its own fund. And then your tithes, of course, go into the regular tithe envelope, and then you can drop them right into the bags, and uh, we'll be able to continue to see God do amazing things here in this church. As our brother prophesied this morning, that God is going to expand this place because there are souls that need to be here on this island. Praise God. God is going to do great things. Hallelujah. Brother Dominic. Father God, again, we just praise you that we could meet together Father God, to be fed by your word, a time of worship and praise to you, O Lord, and not just a meeting to see each other, which we love and enjoy, O Lord, but to meet with you and to have your spirit work in our hearts, O Lord. As it even says in Isaiah, your spirit was upon Messiah to set the captives free O Lord and whom the Son sets free indeed is free indeed Father God you came to set us free O Lord not just from this world but from that which we allowed even ourselves to be addicted to and we just thank you Lord that you have shown us through our pastor through your word and by your spirit, O Lord, how we could be set free to serve you and to be lights in this world, on this island, so others too could be set free for whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And we thank you, Father. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.